we have Ben on now. What we're going to do is I'm going to let uh, Ben just give us kind of some of his top biohacks. But the last time I felt like we didn't really get into audience questions. I so really want to let the audience ask a lot of questions. So send your questions in for Ben. It looks like he's on the same walk. Um, he's been walking for two straight days. Uh, it looks like, uh, it looks like the same clouds there and everything. So Ben, um, you're probably getting exhausted. Uh, tell us what's going on today. <laughs> yeah, I've been walking, uh, fasted for the past, uh, two days since we last spoke and now I'm nervous. Maybe I should run back home and get some protein in my system. So, uh, let's see, aside from that, um, Gosh, sounds like you guys were having a, a great discussion on sleep, and uh, I could I could uh, throw throw a couple extra comments in there if you'd like. And yeah, I agree. I'd I'd love to leave a little bit of extra time for Q and A because I know we we didn't last time. But but I, I had a couple of thoughts regarding sleep. One I was probably already addressed in the chat, and that is that you know the oral bioavailability of melatonin is around that fifteen percent at least at the the four mg dosage that was specified. But the uh, the thing that uh, folks should listen to is, is I, I think uh, Dr. Laurent's already presented and those, those higher dose uh, rectal absorption delivery mechanisms, the, the melatonin suppositories, uh, which I think are around 100 migs, um, you know, that, that's definitely a, an alternate route that I've found to be beneficial. And then uh, uh, two other things that, that you know, I, I think sleep was covered pretty thoroughly but two things I would note is, is regarding the nighttime awakenings, there was some interesting research. I think it came out of Stanford. You know, we all know about the, the cooling effects of sleep being beneficial, but particularly uh, cooling of, of, the, uh, of the forehead seems to downregulate when they look at activity in the frontal cortex and a lot of these racing thoughts, either as you're trying to fall asleep or when you wake up during the night. Those can be uh, downregulated somewhat by cooling the forehead and uh, while keeping a, a cooler full of ice and a Ziploc bag next to your bed might not be uh, something a lot of people are doing right now. I, I do know and I, I've experimented a little bit with it um, and increasingly have been doing so just because I've had more racing thoughts personally before bed, uh, especially if I make the mistake of, you know, pulling open Fox News or CNN in that last hour before bed. But there's a device called the EBB, uh, e -B -B, and it's kind of like a chili pad for your head. And it, it literally is just like a little head-worn uh, device that you flip on to cool the forehead. And uh, that, that one I, I think is interesting. And then the other one is uh, anything that can kind of gently lull you into a little bit more of a delta brainwave pattern and the, the two things I found to be beneficial for that, one is uh, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy, which I think is, is fantastic anyways. You know, I wanted to bring it up just because of the, the what's called the, the so-called Rillo effect, which if you look at, at like a live red blood cell analysis, you see a lot less clumping of the cells due to the, the charge that's induced on the cell surface from pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. So considering that, you know, one of the things that appears to be beneficial for coronavirus is better oxygen delivery to tissue and better oxygenation overall, you know, which is why I also think hyperbaric oxygen therapy is, is uh, if, if you have access to it, is something that's beneficial and, and something that I've been doing every day. But the PMF seems to have an effect on oxygenation and you, you get devices that you can sleep on the entire night. And they also can emit a signal that can cause you to, to get into a little bit more of a delta brainwave production. And they can even downregulate you from, say, like beta to delta and, you know, back up in the morning if you want. And there, there's one device called a, a biobalance mat made by Dr. William Pollock that will stay on during the entire night of sleep. And then there's also a smaller portable device called the Flex Pulse. Uh, and, and the pads for that is if you put them kind of in the occipital area in the back of the head, uh, I, I find this to be really beneficial for napping or sleeping and also kind of get, getting the racing thoughts to go away pretty quickly. Um, and then finally, the last thing is, is regarding the, the sleep component um, is there's, a, there's another device that I've messed around with pretty successfully called the New Calm, uh, NU Calm. And that's, that's got an app that comes with it. And, and of all the apps I've messed around with, like Brain FM or 
or Sleepstream or, or any of these other apps that, that make sounds that you typically pay for headphones while you sleep, I find New Calm to be incredibly, incredibly effective. As a matter of fact, you know, sometimes I'll wake at like 4.30 and I'll just do like a, like a 45 minute New Calm session and kind of get a little bit of extra sleep because it, you just gently drift off to sleep with this thing. And uh, it's, uh, it's just a, a sound that you play through like noise blocking headphones or if you're a side sleeper, there's headphones you can get called sleep phones by allow you to sleep on your side. But those are just a, a, few, a few little thoughts that were rolling around in my head as I was listening to that last little bit on sleep. Uh, but from a, from a biohacking standpoint, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to delve into anything I've been doing um, or take, or take uh, questions from the audience uh, or both. Let me ask you, let me ask you about PEMF, your thoughts since you brought that up. I, not that long ago, I had a building biologist um, come out to my house and I was talking to him about PEMF. He seemed to be, very, be very, a very knowledgeable guy and he had some real concerns around PEMF over time, chronic use sensitizing people to EMF. Have you heard of that? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think the concern is primarily the generator that's being used to deliver the frequency, not the device itself. And yeah, in, in an ideal scenario, you would want that generator farther away from the body. Uh, meaning like if you had like a bedside device, you'd want it plugged into a dirty electricity filter and placed farther away from the bed. And although I, I don't see a lot of good research on these uh, dirty electricity blocking devices, you know, like the Blue Shield or the, or the Key or the Somovetic. Um, I also don't think they're going to do any harm. So the way I have it set up is I've got one of those mats and the, the generator that actually delivers the frequency to the mat is placed far away from the bed. And then next to my bedside, I actually have one of the Blue Shield Cube devices, which, you know, when I, when I run that during the night and I have any other electrical devices running, Anecdotally, I sleep better, as do a lot of my clients who use it. Um, but you know, I can't say I've seen a lot of really good research on the, you know, on the EMF blocking type of devices that you would scatter around your house. However, you know, if, if you're concerned, that could be one step you could take. But I, I don't really think that the devices themselves being in contact with the body is going to somehow uh, condition you to, to. Uh, I, I don't, I don't really even understand how how that would work in terms of conditioning you to, to non-native EMF because it's, it's a native EMF. It's this, it's the same Hertz frequency. You know, we know that the planet earth, if you're walking outside barefoot is going from here from 10 up to hundred Hertz frequencies. And, and that's the exact frequency these devices are delivering. You're, you're not getting anywhere near the frequency you get from like a cell phone or Wi-Fi router or something like that. Yeah. It didn't make complete sense to me, but I thought I'd ask you since it came up um, a question we have from the audience, uh, Michael, you may want to clarify why you're asking this, but I'll go ahead and ask it. Michael said, Ben, would you recommend avoiding or reducing stevia and urethritol during COVID? It seems like he's got a reason for that, but I'll just ask you and then we'll see if we can get a clarification. No, I mean the, the only non-nutritive sweetener I, I would avoid, especially during this time would be saccharin because Saccharin is the only one that's been shown to actually impact the microbiome in a potentially unfavorable manner. And so when we're looking at, at the link between that and the immune system, I, I would avoid saccharin containing artificial sweeteners. But, you know, especially some of these sugar alcohols uh, or more natural non-nutritive sweeteners like stevia or allulose or uh, I'm a huge fan, fan of, of monk fruit. Um, erythritol, if you don't get a lot of gas or bloating or have a, you know, like small intestine bacterial overgrowth or something like that, which that seems to aggravate a little bit. I don't really see any issues with, with any of those. I don't think they're going to help or hurt. Yesterday, Ben, we were talking about zone two versus zone three and exercise during, during COVID. So a question from the audience is how much zone two training versus zone three are you doing right now? And do you have a cutoff for a workout window before bedtime? Well, I, I would say watch the other episode that we did on exercise a, a couple of days ago where I described exactly what I'm doing, what I'm doing. So I don't want to waste the audience's time belaboring a point that I made because we covered my own routine and my reasoning behind it for like a good 20 minutes on the other audio that we did. But it, you know, in, in very short summary, I have indeed 
reduce the amount of high intensity interval training I'm doing, as well as heavy weight training, just to eliminate a lot of the eccentric and inflammatory response to that training. And I have largely replaced it with a lot of kind of zone two walking in the sunshine, uh, briefer blood flow restriction band training. And then as we discussed, you know, very thoroughly in the last episode, breath work, heat and cold. Someone's asking about hydrotherapy. So hydrotherapy with water, um, uh, both cold and hot. Is this something that you have much experience with and would you recommend it for immunity and stress resilience? Also something we, we already covered, the benefits of hot, cold contrast and the many ways to do it. I feel like we tackled that pretty significantly in the last episode. And uh, hydrotherapy would just simply be the water-based version of that. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, case in point, hey, you know, uh, last night my boys went and I went out to the, uh, the hot tub in the cold pool and did our, our Sunday afternoon five hot tub, five cold pool, four, four, three, three, two, two, one, one, and that type of thing, you know, going the, with the 20-second cold, 10-second hot, hot, cold contrast showers, you know, anything like that is absolutely beneficial for nitric oxide, for heat shock protein, down regulation of inflammation. Um, we talked about the study on contrast showers showing reduced incidence of cold and uh, absence of work due to illness. And so, yeah, I think there's definitely, definitely something to it. So somebody has a question about BPC-157 for you. Uh, can you comment on what you believe when it comes to the general effectiveness of the oral form versus injections with BPC-157? Well, one of the other guests, Ryan Smith, would probably be better equipped to answer this question and may have addressed it on his presentation. But it's my understanding that the systemic bioavailability of a subcutaneous injection, um, or as some practitioners, like I know, I believe Matt Cook has done a little bit of this uh, intravenous administration of peptides, you do appear to get better bioavailability compared to oral administration. Although with BPC particularly, since it's a gastric peptide, um, it, it is probably one that could be better equipped uh, to, to, to have good bioavailability on oral administration. But I, I personally, although I've used, for example, like, you know, Dr. Seed's oral BPC-157, um, you know, for, for me, as far as use with injuries, uh, I, I think that sub-Q injection for systemic delivery or, you know, just based on, on my own logic of the the anti-inflammatory potential of BPC, injecting as close as possible to the injury site, which I still do with BPC, unless I'm just focusing on generalized inflammation. But, you know, I, I think that's the best way to use it. Yeah, personally, I think if it's for an injury, I prefer the, the injection. But if it's for gut healing, then it makes sense the oral or someone just will not take the injection. So yeah, just, yeah. I mean, and, and the, the rodent model studies that they did with BPC for, for oral and gastric issues was indeed oral administration, I think, in the drinking water of rats. And so, so yeah, I would say if it's specifically gastric inflammation and gastric issues, you, you'd probably be fine with oral administration. So Jeff asked, Ben, you posted an immune enhancement protocol a few weeks ago, including peptides. Are you still taking these? Any deletions or additions or new information in the last few weeks? I still think that thymosin alpha is something that would be beneficial uh, to, to be taking right now. Um, I think that you could also, although I haven't seen side-by-side -side comparison, get a lot of benefits out of using like a, a thymus extract, you know, like ancestral supplements, for example, has, you know, everything from thymus to prostate to liver to, to kidney to, to brain, you know, derived from a lot of, of uh, grass fed, grass finished animals. And I think that, that the use of like a, a thymus glandular or, or TA1 um, would, would be beneficial. And um, I was using TA1 when I traveled to India a few months ago when the virus was kind of first hitting. Um, and then on, on a second uh, trip that I went, the last trip that I went on before kind of everything went into shutdown down to Hawaii, I was injecting TA1 during that time. But as of right now, um, I'm not using it. Although I, I have to admit that I do have some of the, the thymus liver glandular and I have been just taking that every few days. Um, however, you know, I think we covered this a little bit on the last, audio that we did, my own personal supplementation protocol has not changed significantly because I was already doing things like vitamin A, D, E, and K, you know, cod liver oil or fish oil, um, 
you know, uh, around 10 grams of ascorbic acid upon waking in the morning, uh, along with baking soda. Uh, and you know, a, a lot of, a lot of colostrum, uh, oil of oregano is just kind of a daily immune tonic. And I just haven't really changed any of that. I mean, re really the, the things that I've added, uh, would be, and, and these are, some of these things have been covered or will be covered pretty extensively in the summit, um, nebulizing of glutathione and acetylcysteine. I'm doing that on a daily basis. I am doing uh, rectal or ear insufflation or the use of ozonated water on a daily basis. And I know that ozone was covered pretty, pretty heavily in the, in the podcast with, uh, or the, in the episode with Matt Cook. And then the breath work, heat and cold that we talked about, I've been doing that on a daily basis as well, all of which we, we covered before. But then in addition to that, um, the PMF that I talked about earlier, just for the, the charge separation and the better oxygen delivery. It's also got a little bit of an anti-inflammatory effect. So I am sleeping on a PEMF mat and typically uh, because I have one of those chairs, uh, the Pult Center's chairs, usually for about a half hour of computer work a day, I'm just sitting in that chair and um, using about a 7.8 frequency turned up to as, as high a, a milligauss as I can tolerate. And then um, a couple other things, uh, hyperbaric oxygen, Again, I'm a huge fan of that anyways, just for the stem cell effects, the oxygenation effects, the, just the fact that I can recover more quickly from exercise. Uh, and I just, I just feel amazing every, every time I do it. But I've been using that every day um, just due to the, the effect that that has on oxygen delivery. And, um, and, and I, I did come across one paper. I, I, you know, I don't have the capability to share it in here, but apparently there's, there's some antiviral effect of hyperbaric oxygen as well. And so... You know, I, I found that compelling and I just take a, a nap every day for about you know, 40 minutes or so or go in there, you know, just climb into a chamber uh, and read. I just have like a little soft shell hyperbaric chamber and, and I find that to be pretty beneficial. And then uh, a couple other things I'm doing is um, there's a device called a Nano V and, um, you know, that, that, that one's more involved. The, most of the research on that is, is on the, uh, the protein folding mechanisms so that that can... Um, that can induce and also some of the DNA repair mechanisms and and essentially you're just like inhaling structured water and they're in, inhaling I, I, I would probably use a hydrogen water inhaler if I had one because Tyler LeBaron uh, the director of the molecular hydrogen foundation sent me over some some interesting research on both nitric oxide and hydrogen and its potential in terms of the antiviral activity but everything I found on it, it was all inhalation of hydrogen gas, and I don't really have a hydrogen inhaler, but I, I do drink hydrogen water and, um, and, and have been doing that on a daily basis. But again, that's something that I was already doing. A couple of other kind of um, maybe more, more fringe things, or one, one in particular, one, one kind of fringe thing I've been doing is um, there's this kind of old school concept of rife frequencies. It's very controversial, you know, it was, it was used as a cancer treatment. Um, it has been used for, for antiviral treatments as well. But, uh, you know, the, the Rife generator, that was originally designed by Nikola Tesla. And it's uh, basically like, like a frequency generating device that elicits specific frequencies that uh, appear to be able to, uh, to actually, you know, act on like a viral capsid, kind of similar to like ozone might. And then um, the, these... The, the, this device I'm using also produces PMF and a ton of uh, what are called negative ions, you know, very similar to what you get if you're earthing or grounding. And it's called a, it's called a biocharger. And um, I've, I've actually been using the biocharger every day. And the folks at biocharger develop some specific frequencies. They call it their, their Wuhan protocols. And um, they're two different 15 minute protocols. And supposedly, and again, I, I realize some, you know, we get into the realm of biohacking. That's, that's why it gets a bad name. Like sometimes it's hard to find, you know, really good clinical research on some of this stuff. But um, the, the use of, of these rife frequencies is something I, I find pretty interesting. And again, I don't think it's going to hurt. And I've been using that biocharger, you know, and, and my kids too. You know, when, when we have like reading time in the evenings, we just go down and read by that biocharger. And I run one of the, the immune protocols on it. And they've got some pretty good uh, sleep protocols on that thing too. So, uh, that's it's kind of an interesting device um a little bit spendy but i have been using that one quite a bit and uh then the the, the only other thing is is uh you know again for the nitric oxide uh either the long walks in the sunlight like i'm doing right now or the use of these red light therapies 
like photobiomodulation, you know, like a juve red light panel or an infrared sauna. Um, I think that's prudent as well. So, you know, I'm just, just throwing out there a few of the things that, that I've been doing and, and, you know, that's, that's kind of, kind of what my own biohacking routine would look like would be the use of ozone, uh, nebulizing, the use of the biocharger, the use of, P, of uh, PMF, um, the hydrogen water. I didn't inhale it, but I don't have an inhaler, so I'm just drinking it. And then um, some of those sleep hacks that I talked about earlier, of course, I've also been doing. And then just what I usually do from a supplementation standpoint, colostrum, oregano, vitamin A, D, E, and K, ascorbic acid in the morning with baking soda. And uh, yeah, so those, those are most of the biggies. I'm sure you probably have tons of questions now, so I'll shut up. So somebody asked a, a question on testosterone replacement therapy. They asked, what is your view on testosterone replacement therapy for low to normal, low normal testosterone levels? How important do you think it is to have higher levels for optimal body functioning? Um, I think it's important. I think that it should not be used until uh, other parameters have been taken care of, you know, particularly addressing sleep, addressing any issues with overtraining, particularly chronic cardio, introducing heavy weightlifting or, or high intensity interval training um, instead of the chronic cardio, particularly with the legs, because we know there's a, there's a higher number of androgen receptors in the legs. Addressing a lot of the common uh, micronutrients that tend to be deficient in hypogonadal males, um, particularly uh, zinc, creatine, magnesium, um, boron, really just, just a full mineral spectrum. And uh, even DHEA, to a certain extent, is something a lot of guys find benefit from without going into full testosterone replacement therapy. Uh, and then uh, I think I mentioned creatine. So that, that's a big one. And if you've got a lot of that stuff in place, and um, you've also tackled things from a relationship and a spiritual standpoint, um, meaning, you know, addressed, addressed any of the issues like anger, or fear, or shame that I, I think tend to, from an Eastern medicine standpoint, impact that root chakra in a pretty significant manner. And also if you've, if, if you know, you, you've addressed things like, uh, you know, a sexual connection to your, to your partner, a deep spiritual relationship with them, you know, addressing sex in a more tantric way versus kind of a, a mutual masturbation kind of way. And um, also, you know, even gotten into, into some things like breath work, you know, Kegel exercises and Kegel strengthening, making sure nitric oxide levels are good. Like there's just so many things when it comes to libido, erectile dysfunction, poor sexual performance, et cetera, that can be addressed before turning to hormone replacement therapy that I think that you should have everything in place prior. Now, up until about three months ago, I had everything in place and uh, decided that uh, because I, I finished uh, doing all the racing that I'm doing, which involves you know, USADA and WADA band use of testosterone replacement therapy, I began using a, a morning and an evening, kind of like a microdose of a testosterone cream compounded by uh, another, actually another guest who's, who's been on this summit, Dr. Craig Conniver, and, um, and have, have found it to be uh, sh shockingly effective uh, in terms of the increase in libido, the increase in physical performance. I, honestly, I found that I need to be careful because I recover so quickly that, you know, you, you can, you can, uh, kind of risk if you're a hard charging exercise enthusiast like ligament and tendon damage just because sometimes it's so easy to overtrain or you know come back for another strength train the next day when when really you shouldn't uh, uh because there's still some muscular damage even though your your neuroendocrine system kind of recovers a little bit more quickly with the testosterone therapy um my wife isn't complaining um i i have better energy levels better sleep uh so yeah i, I started using it about three months ago and um, I, I have found it to be nothing short of amazing. But again, I had also everything in place prior to that. So my testosterone basically went from good to great. You know, I, I was around in the 600s. Now I range anywhere from like the 1200 to 1400 range. Hey Ben, what do you think about the study that came out? I think it was maybe five years ago or so that um, linked higher testosterone levels to reduced immune function. I didn't see that study, so I can't comment on it. Um, and I, I don't know what, what the proposed mechanism of action was or, or what the actual effects in the immune system was, um, or if they accounted for, you know, epidemiological factors, you know, like men who might use testosterone as a crutch also living, you know, 
unhealthy lifestyles where they're hanging out in the gym all day long or, you know, sucking down a bunch of whey protein and, and processed red meat or something like that. Like there, there's all, there's all sorts of variables you have to take into account. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to take a look at it, uh, but uh, I, I can't really comment on it uh, that, Mike, that much because I haven't really seen it. I haven't seen it either. Mike, was it super therapeutic or was it just high normal? High normal. Yeah. I'll, I'll send it your way. One question, Ben, uh, about HRV. Someone asked what you found uh, has helped the most with increasing your HRV. Any specific hacks? Breath work. I mean, it sounds dumb, but but there's there's no single way to acutely increase HRV that I've found aside from uh, breath work. And sure, sleep. You know, avoiding overtraining, positive relationships, good energy, gratitude journaling. Um, you know, all, all of these things, you know, yoga, chanting, singing, humming, cold water, anything that increases vagal nerve tone. I mean, if, if you just look up any way to increase vagal nerve tone, any of those things, and I have a whole podcast, I think it's called like 32 ways to increase your, your vagus nerve tone. Any of, any of those strategies work, but honestly, nothing is as effective as breath work at increasing HRV. I mean, that, that's really the, the number one place to start. And it might, you know, part of it is because of the long exhales and the relaxed breath work, kind of like we talked about last time, you know, deactivating a lot of those baroreceptors in the chest, engaging in more deep diaphragmatic breathing, impacting the sinoatrial node of the heart so that you get an, an upregulation of HRV because you get increased interbeat individuality between each beat of the heart. Um, so it might be that, so it might be that, you know, when you have good breath work, a lot of times you do have better sleep. If you have a really good breath work practice, it means you're breathing during your nose, during a lot of your for your harder training sessions, which means you're less stressed and less cortisolic after those. I mean, there, there's a lot of, of side effects of the breath work, but even, I mean, if you slap on a real time HRV measurement tool or, you know, like the nature beat with a, with a Bluetooth enabled heart rate monitor on and just track it in real time, or if you have like an aura ring and you use the moment feature on your aura ring to do a quick check-in, you'll find that, that there is, there's, you know, no, no supplement known to man. And, and, uh, no crazy biohack or anything like that that increases HRV as much as just dropping into a very relaxed breath work session like box breathing or alternate nostril breathing or uh, like four, seven, eight breathing. Earlier today, Ben, we had Richard Drummer on who you recommended to us. Uh, so I know you know uh, Roger. I think I just said Richard. I meant Roger. Um, Roger was talking about adaptogens. Do you, someone just asked from the audience, any specific adaptogens that you really, really like right now? Well, first of all, uh, I think that Richard would have been a better fit because then he just could have called himself Dick Drummer. Um, uh, however, yeah, it is Roger. And the, uh, the uh, adaptogens... Um, you know, I, I actually like Roger's formulations. He's got one called Inner Peace. He's got one called Tian Chi. I like both of those. Um, I, you know, I, I like ashwagandha for, uh, for sleep. Uh, that, that's a nice little powder for the relaxing effect in the evening. I, I like a lot, a lot of mushrooms, I think, cross over into the adaptogenic category, particularly reishi. You know, I mentioned that I take an afternoon nap in that hyperbaric chamber just about every day, and I usually do. Uh, two packets of the Four Sigmatic Rishi before I do that because I find it relaxes me without making me feel too groggy afterwards, you know, when I, when I wake up after my nap. But um, uh, the, the only other one I, I use much is astragalus, and that would be like uh, on a date night with the wife or before sex. Astragalus has some impact on like sexual stamina and libido, and so I've got a little dropper full of astragalus and uh, yeah, it may have some impact on, on longevity and telomeres as well. Um, although it seems that the dosage has to be pretty damn high for that type of effect. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm a real fan of Roger's formulations. They're, they're kind of more like shotgun formulations. So you know, you're getting like 12 to 20 different adaptogens and those things. But, you know, I, I have just like a bottle of inner peace and a few packets of his, uh, his tea on chi blend. And aside from Rishi and a little bit of astragalus, that's primarily what I use. Somebody used to ask about lowering SHBG. If you have any tips for, for that you know there was, there was there was some data that came out last year i believe that people on a higher fat lower carb or ketogenic diet due to the need for upregulated fat transport and higher cholesterol levels may actually naturally have higher levels of shbg 
So in that population, it might not be one of those like neuroendocrine responses to stress, which elevated SHBG often is. A lot of times it, it is, uh, it, 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 it kind of increases at the same time as, as cortisol, um, just, just to, to lock up some total testosterone, you know, potential, you know, I don't know, evolutionary mechanism to down regulation of fertility in times of stress or something like that. But, you know, if, if you look at it from that standpoint, um, if you do need to lower it, if it's not just naturally high due to, let's say, like a higher fat, low carb diet, which I actually see in a lot of people who have low stress levels, low cortisol levels, high fat, low carb intake, uh, a lot of them have high SHBG. And I think it is due to the potential for it to, to interact with some fat transport mechanisms. Uh, but if, if it's high due to stress, pretty much anything that, that you would use to naturally lower stress, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, breath work, sleep, avoidance of overtraining, you know, I feel like a broken record here, but, but uh, yeah, any, any stress mitigation strategies seem to have a pretty significant impact on lowering SHBG. But again, it might not even be something you need to worry about if you're like a, a high fat, low carb type of person. Yeah, I see a lot of patients who have high SHBG and it's just naturally that way when they're, you're a lean person in general, and it, it tends to be more harmful than helpful to try to push on it. Uh, but uh, so other times uh, we can get it down, like you mentioned. Someone asked a question about hyperbaric chambers. So what pressure you use, how long, what's your experience and recommendations around hyperbaric chambers? Yeah, I, I use, uh, uh, it's about 1.4 atmospheres. And then I've got a, a, a 100% uh, like, like a, an oxygen mask that I put on while I'm in there. So there's like an oxygen delivery unit next to the hyperbaric that feeds its tube in. I get in there pressurize it to about 1.4. I use a unit called the Viteris 320. It's made by uh, HBOT USA. It's a soft shell, so that, you know, it's, it's not gonna get to as high an atmosphere as like the, the hard shell units. Um, but it's, you know, for me, it's affordable and it's portable and it doesn't have a big footprint in the home. So that's, that's the one that I use. And as far as, as HBOT protocols, um, you know, I was talking with Dr. Scott Sher about this and I think I'm probably gonna have, have a, an article coming out sooner. I might even podcast with him about this, but a lot of the things that you would use for increasing nitric oxide, whether it be like using red light therapy beforehand or using niacin or beet juice, um, you know, uh, I suppose you could pop a Viagra, uh, but in, anything that's, that's gonna increase nitric oxide production, even like the hydrogen water that I talked about earlier, um, would actually increase the effectiveness of the hyperbaric due to the vasodilation that occurs in response to that. And so, you know, I've started messing around with that a little bit. Um, you know, I've used a little L-citrulline. I've used a little bit of uh, niacin and used some, some beet juice before getting in. And, um, you know, I, I, I think there's something to that idea. And then the other thing that I do is uh, typically when I, when I, and I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to say this because I wouldn't want anyone to like pass out in their hyperbaric chamber but I have a little track I downloaded that I keep on my phone. It's about a 10 minute track that's a DMT breath work. So it's kind of like some rapid fire breath work followed by an extremely long exhale uh, and a very long inhale at the end of the breath work. And if time permits, when I wake up from my nap, which again is anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes in there in the chamber, I actually do that 10 minute breath work routine. And uh, that passed, uh, not this Sunday, but last Sunday I did that in the hyperbaric and I, on the inhale, I held my breath for six and a half minutes. And so, uh, so just because of the, the oxygen and the pressure, you, you can do some pretty long breath holds in there. And you know, I, that, that's kind of me cowboying around with stuff that might be contraindicated. But I actually, when I crawl out of that thing after doing like more intensive breath work, I mean, I, I feel hypercharged the rest of the day, probably due to the, to the uh, amount of oxygenation I get from, from kind of finishing up a nap with some more kind of like active breath work sessions. And uh, the one I use is, is a 10 minute DMT breath work that I just downloaded off of YouTube and converted to audio that I keep on my phone. But uh, you know, th those are a few little things I mess around with in the hyperbaric chamber. And I also, you know, there, there are certain essential oils, uh, peppermint probably being most notable, that seems to really open up the sinus passages and uh, can kind of assist with respiration. And I have a little essential oil blend, it's called Respire. And every, every day before I climb in that hyperbaric chamber, I, I sprinkle a little bit of Respire essential oil in there. I get it from a company called uh, Essential Oil Wizardry out of Ashland, Oregon. And um, I feel like I, I just get even better breath work 
it's, it's the same one I sprinkle in the sauna when I'm doing breath work in the sauna. So, you know, those are a few little, little tricks I throw in with the HBOT. So a good question we got from somebody. I think we all are in agreement that prolonged fasting right now is not necessarily the ideal time for that. But what about the fasting mimicking diet? Do you have any opinions on that? Um, you know, I, I don't know the impact that that would have on the immune system. You know, the, the idea behind it is, is you do get a lot of the, the benefits of fasting um, without some of the potential stress of complete elimination of calories. I, I do uh, for, five, for five days on a quarterly basis. It's almost like a spring cleaning, but it's spring, summer, winter, and fall. I do what's called a, a Kaya Kelpa cleanse, which is kind of similar to the fasting mimicking diet. And it's a five day cleanse where I'm making a, an Indian stew called Kitchari. I have a little bit of ghee. I have a, a big glass of celery juice before each meal, a lot of olive oil. And it's about 40 to 50% of the number of calories that I would normally consume. The way I do it is I skip breakfast and then I just have the Kitchari for lunch and dinner with a little bit of the ghee, the celery juice, and the olive oil thrown in. And I do that for five days in a row. And I typically combine that with lower amounts of exercise and more like trampolining, dry skin brushing, sauna, long walks, you know, again, the breath work, the heat and the cold. And um, I enjoy it quite a bit, you know, from the research I've seen from folks like Dr. Walter Longo, that, that type of, you know, quarterly cleanup for about five days where you're eating 40 to 50% of the, the number of calories you normally consume. I, I think it's a smart idea. Um, I haven't seen any data on whether it's, it'd have a, a deleterious impact on the immune system. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to mess around too much right now with anything that would be like a, a shock on the body. And, you know, I, I haven't done that fast, that kayak alpha cleanse since this whole pandemic began. But I mean, I, I typically do not feel stressed out at all when I'm doing that type of cleanse. I would just say the main thing is, you know, I don't combine it with hefty amounts of exercise. So I get a question that you would you probably refer to Ryan Smith, but this person specifically kind of wants your experience because we've heard you talk about it. What is your experience with dihexa? Yeah, I've, I've used the, uh, the topical dihexa. You know, a lot of these peptides that are less than, I believe about 500 Daltons in size, uh, have, have pretty good uh, uh, um, transdermal delivery. I've used the... Uh, the copper peptide GHK as, as like a skin serum before for that reason. And I've also used the dihexa as a transdermal cream, like right around the carotid arteries uh, for a little bit of a cognitive pick me up. And it, it may also assist with the integrity of the, uh, the blood brain barrier and uh, reduce a little bit of neural inflammation, which if you're low on sleep or uh, you drank too much alcohol or something like that the night before, you know, maybe beneficial for that. Um, you know, I, I don't use it daily, but if I'm, if I'm slightly sleep deprived, I've actually found it to be pretty beneficial. Um, a little bit of dihexa again, applied to, to either side of the neck. Um, so, you know, from my own personal experience, I have found it to give me a little bit more clarity and energy and uh, I'm really just like a more clear head, especially when I normally wouldn't have a clear head. I've also used it when I've, you know, after like long periods of international travel um, for the first few days when I'm still getting, getting back on my, normal time routine. Um, but yeah, I, I like it. Uh, I've certainly used it. I've used it in combination also with FGL and with CMAX. And uh, I, I actually think that's a, that's a pretty cool little cognitive stack when it comes to the use of these more nootropic-ish peptides. Ben, yesterday we mentioned um, a cholinergic, is how some of the cholinergics may have some anti-inflammatory effects and someone just noted that you're chewing gum right now and asked if that's nicotine gum. So what are your thoughts on how to use <laughs> nicotine right now? Yeah, nicotine as a cholinergic is actually pretty interesting. I, I started messing around with it after I interviewed, uh, I believe her name was Diana Driscoll, about the impact of nicotine on some of these acetylcholine receptors and how, how it may actually be beneficial uh, for vagal nerve tone. And uh, the problem is, of course, it's, it's addictive in many of the delivery mechanisms, whether it's gums or sprays or uh, trochees or, you know, chews or, of course, cigarettes. They're, uh, they're accompanied by a lot of other compounds that might not be that hot for you. But um, so first of all, I, I'm right now I'm chewing something called Mighty Gum. Been chewing a lot of that lately. It's, it's like speaking of astragalus, it's an astragalus based gum with uh, like some extra vitamin C and a little bit of zinc. And uh, it's, it's like an immunity gum. And so I've actually been, 
been uh, chewing on that quite a bit lately. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I discovered it about three months ago and just have had a bunch in my pantry. So I've been chopping on that. So that's what I'm chewing around right now is called Mighty Gum. But yeah, I, I have some nicotine gum. I have, uh, I found, uh, when I looked at all the ones that are lowest in artificial sweeteners, uh, Lucy and uh, Habitrol were the two brands that seemed to be the safest. And so I'll typically do a couple times a day, a four milligram uh, piece of nicotine gum, uh, or I also have pure pharmaceutical grade nicotine that I, I get, I believe the company is Blue Brain Boost that I get that one from. And I mean, it's very potent. You wanna keep that out of the reach of children because you know, one, one drop of that is about one and a half milligrams of, or um, yeah, one and a half milligrams of nicotine. So, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty potent. You don't want to overdo it on that stuff. But, uh, you know, that, that doesn't have anything in it except pure nicotine. It's just that, you know, kind of burns. It'll give you the hiccups and it's, it's not that user friendly. And then uh, Dr. Ted Ochocoso, uh, kind of a cool functional medicine doc. He's developed like a nicotine methylene blue CBD microdose trochee that you just kind of dissolve in your mouth. Uh, it's called a blue canatine trochee. And so you're, you're getting uh, the, the um, nootropic effects and the, the upregulation of uh, cytochrome C oxidase, especially if you're getting out in the sunlight or using red light panels from the methylene blue, you're getting some of that cholinergic activity of the, of the nicotine. And then you're also getting a little bit of the focus and enhancing properties of the CBD. So I like those trochees too. But yeah, I, I'm, typically, I'm typically using some smaller form of nicotine on a daily basis and I'm, I'm not opposed to it. Um, and do you, know, you worry I, about the, did you worry about taking nicotine at all during the COVID pandemic and the, um, blood pressure, the concerns about elevated blood pressure? Yeah. Um, I'm aware of those concerns. I, I'm not personally concerned. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something I haven't given a, a great deal of thought to, but you know, I, I think with the, the very small amounts that I'm using versus like, you know, cigarettes or, or vapes or, you know, these, these 20 mig snooses that you can get, you know, I'm, I'm microdosing with it, um, you know, in a, in a pretty moderate manner. So I'm not too concerned, but it would be a good point for anyone who, have, who is of course smoking or vaping or using higher doses of nicotine, I think. Um, it was kind of funny because I was, I was talking with uh, uh, Ron Penna, who's, who's an interesting guy. He's, he's one of the founders of Quest Nutrition. And he, he was talking to me about, you know, the, the potential hormetic effect of cigarettes, you know, and, and how you might get some life extension properties. And I think he had done the calculation that like smoking one cigarette every 17 days may actually increase lifespan. I'm not doing that, but uh, for some reason, I also, I, I, I thought about that as part of this discussion. So, you know, maybe once this whole pandemic is over, everybody can go through a, a pack of cigarettes a year. So we're going to end on Ben recommending that everybody start smoking. Uh, <laughs> no, so uh, one thing you did say about the nicotine, you mentioned the, the four milligrams. What I would say to anybody, if you're nicotine naive, uh, that's a lot. <laughs> so you know, so just think about that before um, you're not being greenfield. So um, what he says, uh, you may want to start with something different if you're going to try. Yeah, I, I, I tend to need higher doses of it. Like if I, like for me, a, a microdose of, of psilocybin, for example, is almost a gram. You know, I, I just, I seem to have a high tolerance to just about anything. Uh, maybe it's, maybe it's leftover from my bodybuilding years where I, I overused stimulants pretty excessively and, you know, was doing like 12 shots of espresso and a couple of red lines a day. But uh, regardless, yeah, yeah, it's, it, all, it all depends on the user. I'd start with like one milligram, not four. So Ben, um, to end, other than encouraging people to smoke and do shrooms, um, <laughs> you would like to, to, to end on today to everybody, any, any message you'd like to get out before uh, we talk to, um, about some orthobiologics next? Um, I, I guess the last thing that's been on my mind is it, it seems in the past three days, especially I have been inundated with, of course, not just the usual news on, on the virus statistics and the emergences in, in some of the newer testing protocols, some of the, uh, some, some of the, um, the, the treatments that are being used, you know, the spread of the virus, the different countries, the, the rate of the flattening curve, et cetera. But I've also been inundated really heavily of late with a lot of these conspiracy theories, you know, and you guys are familiar with them. I'd be, 
you know, if I brought them up, everybody probably has heard the chatter around whatever, you know, Bill Gates or 5G or, you know, And um, I think that that can create a lot of anxiety and stress and fear and almost create more questions than it answers. And um, especially, especially at night when I know it's so easy because I found myself getting pulled into it. I wouldn't say this unless this was something I had to struggle with the past few days. I found myself getting pulled into that in the evenings. And I would say just keep a kick-ass fiction book or some other reading material you know i think i mentioned this on the last podcast like i'm reading a biography of the spokane indian tribe right now just keep something on hand in the evenings preferably that doesn't have a screen for the sleep issues that you probably just learned about in the in the uh in the webcast that was before mine and just check yourself out starting about at least an hour before bed and just immerse yourself in something that has nothing to do with this shit at all whether it's the conspiracy side of it whether it's the news side of it anything like that just like give yourself permission to withdraw from all of this about an hour before bed and i think for me maybe it's because i'm a bookworm but for me i encourage folks to just like use that as the time to, to catch on up on that book you've always wanted to read or whatever maybe you never did the harry potter series so you get into that or maybe there's some fantastic biographies you want to delve into but I mean, that's, uh, that, that's what I'm inspired to tell people right now is just give yourself permission to totally check out of all this stuff about an hour before bedtime at least. Yeah, that's great advice. Use the extra time you have to dive into some of those things you may uh, not normally have time for, like reading a book or listening to good music. I really, really appreciate that advice. advice. So, ben, thank you so much for coming on again. It's always, always great to see you. And, uh, it looks like a beautiful day there, so we're going to let you enjoy the rest of it outside and with your family. All right. Well, guys, thanks for having me on, and thanks for everything you're doing. Thanks, Ben. All right, later.